Do you like your current state of being? How is your character and your attitude towards life? Let's talk about regeneration. Welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure created by clergy in the Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. I'm Pastor Amanda Sparrow. And I'm Anthony Alegria. And today we have a very special guest with us here in the studio, and I'll let him introduce himself. I'm James Lunsford, pastor of Fly Church of the Nazarene. All right, and in this episode, we are very excited to have Brother James here with us, and Pastor Amanda is also back. Um, it's wonderful to have the, the crew all together. Today, we are going to be talking about regeneration. And yeah, that is one of those peculiar theological words which may throw you for a loop if you're not used to hearing it. But if you stick with us, we're going to have a really good conversation. We're going to build off of our conversation from last week where we talked about repentance. And there is a need for you to have very specific language about the sin issues in your life or even particular issues you may have and you see in the world around you. Giving a clear name to something using precise language helps people address it and then move forwards. But of course, if you want to move forwards, you have to have something to aspire for. And regeneration is a conversation about being transformed into something else. It's a very interesting um, topic, and we will get into all of those details. And this is going to examine Article 9 in the Church of the Nazarene, although not all of Article 9. So without any further hesitation, I'll go ahead and I'll let Pastor Amanda read with us a little bit of Article 9, if she would. Right, so this is kind of Article 9 points 1 and 2, and it reads as follow. It says that we believe that justification is the gracious and judicial act of God by which he grants full pardon of all guilt and complete release from the penalty of sins committed, and acceptance as righteous to all who believe on Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior. We believe that regeneration, or new birth, is that gracious work of God whereby the moral nature of the repentant believer is spiritually quickened and given a distinctly spiritual life, capable of faith, love, and obedience. And I love that language of quickened, quickening. Um, often I say, I'm going to quicken Anthony, lest to be made an anchorite walled up into the building. And again, we'll, we'll say this much, the word quickened has not been said unlike quickened. You have to say it just like that every time, otherwise yes, it doesn't there carry is, the same meaning. It does not carry the same meaning unless you have the proper enthusiasm when you're quickening someone. Anyways, back to our, our opening statement. Oftentimes we realize when we look at our own life and we examine the world around us, that there are things which chain people down. And we realize that Christ is our hope. And in fact, when we look at the world, Christ is the only hope for the world. And a lot of times people want to make idols out of all sorts of stuff. Again, if you've heard our program, you know I think the biggest idol in our day and age is that of identity. But people find their identity in all sorts of stuff. They idolize politics. They idolize different groups. They idolize things which should not ever be taken out into the public sphere. They idolize all sorts of crazy things. And thus they neglect any sort of hope and aspiration. They, they leave themselves in a really unfortunate place. Last week we discussed repentance and confession and the importance of using precise language in confession. And oftentimes we think of confession and repentance only in terms of personal sin, yet sin is complex. It has ramifications on the world around us. Sometimes people do bad things and it really messes up the world. And, you know, that's a big problem. A lot of times we've, we've watered down the concept of sin to where people don't think it has much value. They say, oh, well, that's just a religious thing. It, it'll change my relationship if I'm a Christian, but it's not going to affect the world. Sin actually has big, serious ramifications for the world. And regeneration is something which is an important thing to have in your tool belt when you're talking about these things. The concept of regeneration, if we actually want to do something about a world riddled with sin. And let me open up by just throwing this over to Brother James and say, what is regeneration? Brother James. Well, regeneration, uh, to go to the Bible and say, what does the Bible, language does the Bible use in particular? Um, I immediately go in my mind to Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, where he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again, or some modern translations will say you must be born from above, a spiritual birth that Jesus describes as necessary to Nicodemus. Or again, in the writings of Paul, we would find phrases like new creation or new creature, where God has recreated the human being in the process of this repentance, forgiveness, regeneration, that aspect whereby that part of us that is broken 
by sin and the sin nature that is uh, endemic to our race yeah. is recreated um, and we become a spiritually alive creature that's capable of doing right, making moral choices, having faith yeah. and love toward God. All right, Pastor Amanda, one of the things that Brother James mentioned rather early was this idea of being born of above. Do you think that that preposition thrown in there specifically of above is something worth emphasizing? What are your thoughts on that? And well, yeah, and I think we see this in the context of, of Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, um, that this born again is not kind of an arbitrary or a random new start. Um, it's not just something like you get a do-over in life, um, but that the, there's something where the entirety of your identity gets rewired, rechanged, um, where the world can no longer define you by its parameters, uh, that you are born of above, and therefore the parameters by which you are identified by are from above, from heaven, from from God. And, and so that does, it gives us a very clear uh, theological point to start with, especially in this conversation of regeneration. Uh, something very specific is happening. Uh, you are being born again with a purpose to become that which God created you to be. All right, so within the Christian tradition where you understand that people are born into a fallen state, there's this idea that we have original sin. You out there in the audience, you, you were born into a world where the natural tendency is to just curse God and die because sin is entered in the equation. All of us need regeneration. We need this to happen in our life. We need to be transformed. We need a new creation. We need to be born again. Again, not some random, oh, I just want another start, but an actual change of direction. It's born again from above. We need that to happen. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and say you're struggling with sin, say you say, well, I see Christ. I want to be more and more like Christ. I want to be a good, faithful Christian, but there's some sin that's in my life that I'm struggling with in Again, the word struggle is actually the correct word here because you're you're kind of fighting something and it's ensnaring you. And if you lose this battle, you're trapped there, you're a new slave to it. Actually, the correct use of the word struggle. You you might wonder, well, I, I want this. How does this relate to me? Um, Brother James, let me ask this question. If someone says, well, how long is regeneration? They say, you know, is it is it a process? Is it something which happens, you know, in the, the process of me? As a believer coming closer to God, where does regeneration fit? And am I saved if I'm someone who who has professed Jesus, but I I'm still feel like I'm fighting sin? You know, where where does salvation fit in with regeneration and this idea of things being a process? Where talk to us a little bit about all that. Hmm. So I think of regeneration, and I go back to that controlling metaphor from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus of birth. You must be born again, born from above. Well, birth is a moment, right? There is a time when you were born and it's, there was a process of growth and gestation and the before and after, but that's a moment. Yeah. When, when you, you passed into this world um, and as a, as a baby, you were born, your mother gave birth to you. That was an instant. That was a moment. So um, when I think of regeneration, I don't think process that has some duration in time. I think of an instantaneous moment where God recreates you. You uh, cease to be a spiritually dying creature separated from God and you become a spiritually alive creature connected to God through the agency of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit within you and it alters your orientation toward God. Yeah, And the idea that sin may remain in the believer, in the regenerate believer. And there is a process. I, I think that we deal with that theologically by saying there is a difference between maturity. Yeah. Right? Um, there is this process that a believer continues. Um, also, one of those things about saved, right? Saved is a, a moment person is saved, meaning when we say that, right? When we say saved, what do we really mean? What we mean is that uh, underlying that concept is, well, a person is lost yeah. until they're saved, right? They're in a state where their eternal destiny would be one, um, the old word hell, separation from God for eternity. And then you're saved so that your eternal destiny has been 
changed and you are now a heaven-bound soul, but you are also in the process of being saved because yeah. you are continuing that journey toward God um, as you go on living. But regeneration happened that moment when you repented and put your faith and trust in Christ as Savior. All right, so there is a distinct moment. And that's an important thing. I know a lot of times our culture doesn't like to give fine points around things. They like to say everything kind of mushy. There's no objective, anything. Pastor Amanda, what hope could you give to someone who, who is professing Christ as their Lord, but they're, they are still wrestling with things? And again, wrestling being that they, they feel as if they're entangled, they're fighting something. Um, what hope could you give to someone in well, that moment? I think we continue this analogy we're using of a child being born. Um, a, a, a child or a baby does not stay a baby, that there is growth. Um, the baby learns how to walk, how to talk, how to think abstractly, um, how to feed themselves. They go from milk to solid food to eating steak. There's this growth that happens. And so some of the struggles that you may have as an infant, uh, like the inability to communicate adequately with your parents, that gets worked out as you continue to learn and continue to be taught. And so regeneration, it's, it's, it's interesting because there is that moment, but it, it affects the present. It will affect the future. It's not stagnant. It does not mm. simply stay in the one moment, but it, it, it ripples uh, throughout life and really throughout all of creation. And, and so for the hope is that now, and then Paul continues this analogy even in his writing, and he will sometimes use it as an analogy to, to encourage the believers in certain churches. It says that you're infants, continue to grow in the faith. And sometimes he'll use it really as kind of a rebuking because he's like, you know, you've been growing in the faith and yet you still act like babies. You're still drinking milk. You should be eating solid food by now. And so there, there's Steak. this... Yeah, you should be eating steak. I, I do like Amanda's aspiration that it, the hierarchy of things, <laughs> steak is at the top. Yes, um, I am a big carnivore um, to my uh, hu husband's chagrin. Um, he's a vegan. But anyways, um, but there is this, this movement that is called on all believers. Now, and what we should see, though, is not um, a worldly shame that says, oh, I'm not like that Christian. I'm still struggling. That's not what we should do. What we should say, have a godly Really, um, Paul also writes about godly guilt that calls us to transformation. And it's not this thing that we should shrink away from, but it's something that motivates us and says, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I am getting there by God's grace. I can grow, I can mature, and the struggles I'm having now do not have to define my life for all of eternity. And that doesn't discount the struggles we have currently, but it does say that there is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train coming to get us. Um, but there is there is peace and there's growth that can happen. And you know, sometimes for some people, I've heard stories, they've been struggling, they've been fighting over a certain addiction or a certain sin, and, and it goes away in an instant as soon as they're saved, sanctified, and regenerated. Or And, and sometimes it takes days, it takes weeks, it takes years, it takes a lifetime. But regardless of where we find ourselves in that journey, in that process, we have assurance that as long as we are following Christ, he is regenerating us. Well, in a second, I'm going to ask a question. We may go in a bit of age order to the best of our ability to answer this question of how our culture actually feels about the concept of regeneration. But before I do that, another thought coming off of that in, in our modern world, they want to line everything up and say, oh, well, the church doesn't like people or they're, they're hating and they really some lazy, unstimulated thoughts. How does the the church feel about people who are wrestling with that? What What is the church's disposition towards someone who is saved? They have hit that that point, which we can actually point to. We can, we can clearly articulate a, a thing where it says someone, they have confessed Jesus, they have experienced these these initial works of, of grace that really are there. They're not things which are products of our own agency, but they're products of the agency of the Holy Spirit. And they're still wrestling with things and they're moving towards sanctification. They want to, but they're struggling with it. How, does, how should the church respond to those people? Do, let me just put that in a very simple question that we can answer abruptly. <laughs> does the church hate people who have yet to reach <laughs> sanctification? Well, I sure hope not. I hope that we love people, whether they're saved uh, people progressing in their journey toward Christ um, in the process of being saved and yeah. sanctified and maybe even for us Nazarenes on the journey toward entire sanctification and yeah. 
spiritual maturity beyond that. But I hope that we love people before they're ever born again while yeah. they're still... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. S- before they're even seeking and Christ. And love doesn't mean enabling. For the record. If no, somebody no. says, well, if you love me, give me the tools so I can go rob a bank. No, 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 love, that's not in your best interest. Um, I, I'll just go to C.S. Lewis's preference for the good old-fashioned English word charity in place of love, which really, I think, biblical love, when the New Testament writers are saying, love your neighbor, it's seek good things yeah. for other people. Seek what is best for them. Um, maybe not what makes them feel best, right? But right. what is best for them. Right. Um, well, let's go back to this question of how does our culture actually feel about regeneration? When we look at our world, I mean, and again, suffering is something which is intrinsic to life. And you can find this both with people or even with animals. Of course, I think everyone knows I have two dogs. Um, my dog's pretty, I don't know why they would ever be miserable and pout. They have every luxury an animal could want. I mean, they're both canis lupus, descendants of wolves of the wild. And yet when I'm home many nights, if I'm not in the floor with them, again, one's like a 12-year-old chihuahua, the other's like a five-year-old blue healer, they will sit in the floor with their backs to me and pout. <laughs> um, even for a dog, suffering is like a vacuum. It's always at its greatest. They, they should have every pleasure in the world. They should be happy. But yet our world, which recognizes suffering, and again, across all life spectrum, People experience horrific sufferings, the loss of of loved ones. They experience loss of even things like losing children. And they feel the plague and weight of this. And for so many people, when they hit these crises which manifest in life, whatever the crisis may be or series of of crises, they often feel that they are slave to it. And many times we find that people who, without the proper aspiration, without the hope of Jesus Christ, They allow great tragedies to turn them into monsters. And when we look throughout the history of the world, and I've even been, again, I've been reading a lot of Jules Verne lately, and I've been reading a lot of world history, and I've been doing that for Lent, as odd as that may seem. I've been abstaining from news, and I've been reading a lot of classics of literature. And I've come to look at things like human sacrifice differently as I was preparing for regeneration, because I realized people who do not look to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. They don't want that life when that's not at the top of their their list of aspirations. They will find something else. And people who have legitimately throughout history willingly been sacrificed. And a lot of times the niceness of the West doesn't want to admit that, yeah, some people were forced to be sacrificed. Some people wanted that. I think there's an element where people, they wanted to be regenerated into something which was quite grotesque because that was what their aspiration was. So I'm going to throw this question around to the room, and I think I'll start with Anthony. Do we think that our culture, as it is now, and I'm going to say our secular culture here in the West, does it want regeneration or is it opposed to it? Anthony, what are your thoughts? Well, firstly, they definitely don't care very much for regeneration from the Christian God. But aside from that, um, they also don't really want change from an outside source and i think where a lot of people in my generation and culture are focusing on change is more about the world changing they they understand the tragedy of the world and they want that to change rather than understanding the world that they live in and changing themselves and um and also not to mention understanding their own depravity and desiring a change uh in themselves for that reason also and so at that point you have basically removed everything about regeneration that isn't just positive change so i would say they are not very apt to regenerate well just to build off that i know i've talked a lot about captain nemo who he sees the world has fallen and his response is i want to go back to the void there in early genesis another jules verne character is rober the conqueror who looks at the world and says well the world has fallen so i'm going to create giant machines and i will be the conqueror of the world and that's how a lot of people are they say i will be the one who will fix and redesign society i will be the conqueror because i have something special about that and i'm going to throw this to pastor amanda who looks like she's about to bust <laughs> <laughs> no um i was just thinking of when we were talking about this earlier and, and and thinking through what our culture's responses to regeneration and i think we see so much in our pop culture that this fascination uh, with makeovers, this fascination with redoing and uh, renovating, uh, whether it's houses or, 
or ourselves and things like that. And I was reminded of there's a, a show that was on a couple years ago called uh, 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 What Not to Wear. And so it was this makeover show and they would grab random people who wore these awful outfits and they would talk about it. And in talking with these people, they would find there were actually like deeply emotional issues about why these people dress the way they dress. And it was usually because either to hide themselves or to show themselves even more so they could get attention. So out throughout this whole show, they'd give them a new wardrobe and they're like, ah, oh, don't you have a new life now? And, you're like, and I think that it's, it's very shallow, but I think it's very indicative of our culture. We crave regeneration, but we think because we slapped a new coat of paint on it or because we changed what we wore, maybe we talk a little bit differently, that somehow that's it. Yeah. That we have, we have figured out what the problem is. And what's funny is this is a fashion show and they were trying to deal with these deeply troubling emotional issues or social issues or or um, relational issues. And you're like, okay, two fashion experts are not qualified <laughs> to deal with these issues. Right. And, and I think that's what our culture is fascinated with this idea of regeneration, but we are, we are poorly and extremely ineptly equipped to deal with it Brother on our James, own. Brother James, what do you think? Well, I'll, I want to pick up on something Amanda just said and make sure we clarify. When we talk about regeneration, we are absolutely not talking about slapping a new coat of paint on it. Yeah. You know, um, we have to make sure that we're PC. After all, we're all Nazarene clergy, right? We have to make sure we're careful with our words. But um, I oftentimes think that there is in the modern context, even within the modern Christian context in America, the idea that I come to Jesus and I repent and I confess and Great, God forgives me, the, the blood of Christ somehow makes it possible for my sins to be forgiven. But deep down, many people think of, you know, so I, I said my prayer, I made my repentance and confession, and but I'm still just a sack of poo, right? I'm still just a dirty, rotten sinner, but somehow God has wrapped me in the clothes of Christ and to which I say that is absolutely not the doctrine of ge regeneration. Yeah, yeah. Um, whatever that is, it's not what we're talking about. <laughs> it's not even what I think happens when we're forgiving or what we mean when we confess, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. We mean a real, internal, uh, substantial change in my being yeah. so that I am no longer primarily oriented away from God, but that I am in fact connected to and oriented to God. Well, let me build off of this just a little bit. When we talk about regeneration, a lot of times people make investments in things which are not necessarily good. Um, this could be an idol, it could be an ideology, it could be all sorts of things. People make an investment. And with regeneration, it is a bit intense in the sense that there is an element of death and rebirth. And one of the, I know a lot of people, they want to romanticize the biblical exile. Anytime people go out into the wilderness, oh, it's, it's so cute and fuzzy. You know, Moses, they're coming out of the wilderness and they got to say, there's this idea that says this whole culture kind of has to die and something new be reborn. And that means if you've made an investment in that, you, you may lose that investment. But in the end, it, is freeing. It's liberating. There is a new life available, but you've got to recognize that it's not yourself that you're being turned into, but is the hope found in Jesus Christ. There's something above, and again, that preposition, very important, above, that you're you're looking to and you're being transformed, and it's the Holy Spirit, which is the, the engine, the agent of that. Anthony. I was just going to point out to your point, the idea that sometimes there is going to have to be a whole world turnover a whole generational turnover to really change the direction that the people of God are heading. And that takes place really obviously at least like three times. There's Noah's Ark. There is uh, the 40 years in the desert. Whenever the liter it's, it's written only two people got to go to the promised land who were in the previous generation. It was Caleb and Joshua. And then um, there is the exile. And so it's like three times that actually does occur. And those are three really big stories in the Bible. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's a recurring theme that, that people have a withdrawal. And in that withdrawal, they, something can happen. But before we get too far, I want to go back to this idea of is our culture actually interested in this? Because I think on one hand, there are people who want to regenerate into the idol of the age. 
In our modern world, it's identity politics. And Amanda was using the term identity earlier. She was using it in its correct meaning. But a lot of times people turn identity into a buzzword. And they, they're not even having coherent thoughts about it. And there's this idea where if your identity is yourself, you know, I'm perfect the way I am, I don't need any improvement, then people say, well, I don't think I, ha I, I have no notion of sin in my life. Why should I change? For those people, they won't see the need for regeneration. For others who recognize, and even if they're looking to an idol of age, they say, well, I want to be a different group than I am. Or you see all sorts of things where people, they, they look and they try to regenerate into something different, even if that's not the case. And even when I've looked throughout history and see things like human sacrifice, most people aren't very interested in that. But then you get a handful of people who are like, yeah, I would like to regenerate. I would like to be the one whose blood appeases the gods. You, you actually find people who are willing to do it. And it's a bizarre thing and it's hard to understand. But when you start thinking about that there is something deep within the race that recognizes the concept of sin. And in our modern world, every time I hear people use the language of hate and fear, I think they are somehow connected to our, our hard wire, which is inclined to recognize both sin and the need for confession. But at the same time, when our world wants to reject Christian tradition and everything which has been handed down through us through the ages and through the, the difficulties of that, they find themselves in a bit of a mess. Um, let's move on a little bit, and I'll throw some other questions here for our, our panel to discuss. So one of the things which I, I find to be rather sad and unfortunate is that our world does not address problems well. It does not come to people and, and encourage them out of that transformation. I really feel like this is something which leaves people underwhelmed. Um, we're not able to, to address personal responsibility and personal guilt and even personal sin will. And that leaves us without hope because, again, you're not hoping for something higher. Pastor Amanda, I wanted just to throw this back to you. And I know I asked you a question about hope mm -hmm. before, but what are your thoughts on actually recognizing the need for a generation and recognizing the hope that comes from being made a new creature? Yeah, um, I think it's it's kind of odd. Again, our culture does this weird thing where it almost simultaneously recognizes sin and doesn't. Um, I don't think too many people be have to, you don't have to debate too many people into believing that the world is broken. Um, I think a lot of people recognize that. Mm. And they recognize that the wrong things that person A does can affect person B. Um, but again, there's this trouble within what is the remedy? Uh, for that and then what are the the consequences for that and who should be held accountable for the consequences right. and this thing all of a sudden the brokenness of the world becomes this very complex thing when we try to parse it out and figure it out and this is where really kind of quite beautifully uh, God comes in but actually God comes in long before this and this is where we go back to the, the to our theology of provenient grace uh, where all of creation was created to be made whole and complete and so there was this perfection in the beginning where, where all of creation, where all of humanity and, and God lived in, in harmony. And, and this regeneration is this call back to that. And, and the hope is that, one, yeah, we have to recognize what sin is. And we have to recognize why sin is and what, what exists in that. And sometimes it's a, a lot of all the time. It is more complex than our culture tries to make it. Because I think our, our culture tries to basically uh, control the narrative. And then if they can control the narrative, then they can control the remedy. Right. And so if the basis of sin is this, then I can sell you the remedy that's this. Um, however, if we actually dive deeper and we find that it is this broken human nature, this, this, this striving for self and self to be in control and self mm. to either to for self to kind of for the examples you were using to be Nemo and to hop on the submarine and go to the depths where I no longer have to deal with other people's silliness or where I get to become the conqueror and redesign the world in my image. That's still selfishness. <laughs> um, and, and, and God's remedy is quite different in the sense that, that that actually what God does is instead of saying, OK, burrow deeper into yourself or burrow deeper into the, the collective, whether, you know, so whether it's uh, sinful individualism or sinful collectivism, it's still sinful. Um, but regardless of where you try to find that rem remedy, what God says is you're going to find peace. You're going to find wholeness. You're going to find love and actually abandoning the striving to self and uh, to be regenerated is for that whole being to be redesigned 
into this focus of who God is. And this is the God who put on flesh, walked amongst us, and surrendered to death, even to death on the cross. And there's this beauty that then Paul writes where if we share in that death, our hope is then in the resurrection. And so this is what regeneration is. It, like, um, like <laughs> our pastor shared earlier, it is this movement where orientation has been shifted. And now we look at who God is, and then now we have hope. Brother James, I'm going to throw a question to you that we did not discuss at all in show <laughs> okay. prep, but it emerged out of Amanda's conversation. This reminds me a little bit of a pilgrimage in the sense where you are wanting to be transformed. You, you want an experience which is going to change you, fundamentally change you. And it's not a journey to the center of the self. It's not a journey to the collectives of the world, but it is of something that is of God that will come and transform you. Do you see any connection with some sort of a a pilgrimage there? And I just wanted to throw that out. This sort of idea that is something a pilgrimage, the, a journey. The agency, and again, I'm not talking so much about the the journey of the pilgrimage, but the fact that there's something, there's an agent out there that is worth your attention, is worth your pursuit, and it can change you. And it's not a worldly collective, it's not yourself, but something something else. Something else, you know, the Amanda has mentioned, and it's so key, I think, to one understanding who and where humans find themselves as well as the topic regeneration is to go back to the Christian view of the world, which says in the beginning, God created and he created the whole world and he created human beings. And when he created us, he created us in fellowship with him so that we actually drew life if you read right the genesis stories of creation it is actually god himself that gives life to human beings so our life our life force that whatever the secret sauce that makes flesh really a living being flows from god it's so beautiful in the second chapter of Genesis where God forms the human uh, from the earth and then breathes the breath of life. It's you know just beautiful image of a of a craftsman or a an artist making something but then sharing the actual divine essence pushing the breath of God into that thing that's been formed and making it come alive which I, just because I very often am a very visual thinker, um, see sort of in my mind's eye as, as a tangible connection to the divine. Now, I believe, maybe more theologically informed, that that link to God is the Holy Spirit, that His Spirit links to our spirit, and we are, by that Spirit, made alive in Christ Jesus. But what happened when sin entered the picture, when the human being chose to reject God and choose their own way, is it severed that connection. The actual flow of life through the Holy Spirit ceased human beings uh, spiritually dead. I still think it's too simple a way of saying it. It's like we became spiritually dying creatures instead mm -hmm. of spiritually living creatures. And that's been going on since. And so the idea that regeneration happens in a moment when we become reconnected with the Spirit of God, reoriented so that life, spiritual life, is now flowing to us from above. Again, Jesus' phrase to Nicodemus, born from above, is in fact that journey back yeah. to the way we were designed to be, connected to God spiritually, receiving life from Him directly, spiritual life. All right, well, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up, and let's go back to this word, quickens. Um, <laughs> and we will quicken right. Anthony to to perhaps go back in and read for us. Actually, not really. I'm not going to make him do that. But we get this language in there that, that a person is quickened, which... Made does, alive. Yeah, they're made alive, and they're made capable of faith. They're made something new. It's not the same. So quicken is an interesting verb. It really does mean to revive, to make something alive or lively. It kind of encourages and stimulates them towards a, a cause and it gives a, a, a new life to something. 
In this context, one becomes spiritually in tune to the transformation, transforming work of God and reflecting Christ in the world. The idolatry of the self, or perhaps any ideology which can become an idol, that these idols, they come and they, they inhibit people from actually valuing the, the life, the, the truth, and the way which is found in Christ Jesus. But once one is regenerate, they're able, the world is different. They have been quickened. And I want us to talk a little bit about quickening in that verb real quick. So we'll, we'll kind of end on, on that note because once one has been quickened, they're then able to bear witness with the Holy Spirit coming and working in their life. There's a new opportunity. Um, Brother James, talk to us a little bit about quickening. About quickening, being made alive, being enlivened so that we can have faith and love and obedience. Wow. Faith, love, and obedience, right? <laughs> um, I, one, one has to recognize there's something worthy to obey in order to have obedience. Well, and one has to realize that something needs to be quickened, right? That, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all of the efforts that precede the coming to Christ, repentance and forgiveness that occurs when we trust in Christ as our Savior and repent of our sins. Before that time, save for the provenient grace of God, we are incapable of choosing righteousness. We are incapable of faith and love and true obedience. So in our, our fallen state, we don't have that ability. No, another thing that we're not, we're not Pelagian, right? We don't believe that we can just will ourselves to be good and will ourselves to be right with God. We actually believe, no, we can't, but God is gracious and through His grace, allows the Holy Spirit to come to us before we even repent right. and give us the ability. But once we make that choice, empowered by the Holy Spirit to repent, He makes us alive. He quickens us, transforms our being so that we're no longer this creature that can't do right, but we can do right. We can have faith, we can love, and we can obey. And Pastor Amanda, as one is quickened, <laughs> the kingdom of God, and heaven. They are things which start to break into a person's life. And a lot of times people think of heaven just being a destination, but as one is quickened, it's more than just a destination. It's something the kingdom of God it is active in one's life. No? Yeah. Well, and I think in um, this idea of regeneration, it's not, you mentioned earlier, a lot of times we kind of uh, separate out this idea of sin. If it's only a spiritual matter, then if I, you know, if it's only a Christian matter, if I do not believe in the Christian theology, then I, I do not have to believe in sin. Yeah. And then so we're done. We're kind of over with the conversation. But if sin is something that actually is prevalent in all of our lives and this destruction and brokenness, then when we talk about regeneration, then we have to also say that it is not just merely a spiritual thing, although it definitely is, that our entire lives have become regenerated. And now there is a purpose in our lives. And that purpose is how is seen in how we interact with the world. Um, and it's interesting in, in one of the passages that Paul talks about, uh, you know, the behold, the old is gone, the new has come. We regard everyone not from a human point of view, but, but it, you know, through the view of Christ. Um, it also, he talks about now we are ambassadors of rec this reconciliation. We are ambassadors of this regeneration. And so therefore, not only now have you been recreated, uh, you have been redeemed, but now you are sent. So yeah. you have purpose, you have focus. There is this orientation that says, now you get to do something with your life that is far more meaningful and powerful than anything you could have created within your own self and within your own power. And and I think, I mean, that's just good news. That's gospel right there. Because yeah. I think sometimes, again, we try to segment these things out to be purely theological and purely spiritual. And what we have to find out is though actually theology and spirituality impacts everything about us yeah. in our entire lives and and i mean it just I, it's just it's amazing because god did not come just to save an abstract concept of the soul he came to save creation yeah and that's the thing is sin actually does have real world ramifications um it's not just a fun thing to talk about in sunday school like it it really really and even with something i alluded to earlier the idea of like human sacrifice a lot of times people say well you know those first few commandments are only really relevant They'll say, well, I can kind of see the objective truth and, you know, don't don't murder your neighbor or something like that. But really, if your 
idol. If you you worship something other than the the Lord God, the master of the universe who who created the universe, you do start to be tempted to things like, yeah, maybe sacrificing myself wouldn't be so bad. You do see a lot of weird products of idols when people idolize something and say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be transformed in that. Um, whatever grotesque image, um, insert deity here, demands of me, it starts to look a little bit more appetizing. Sin does have real world ramifications. Well, any final thoughts before we close? Anthony? Yeah. Um, so I have two final thoughts. The first one is along your line of thought that uh, sin does have real world ramifications. I think if, if you start out with a God who is a loving God and who wants the best for his creation, then obviously the rules and parameters that he gives you and creates are for your own benefit and good. It's not as though God is selfishly trying to bind us to his will, which would be only to serve him. God wills good things for us. And so those things, those that those rules are actually freedom from suffering. And uh, so that, I think, there's a lot of logic there that makes that make sense. And then beyond that, I, kn I noticed just now, regeneration is actually a really, really great name and word for this. Because whenever you take time to break it down, like gen is a Greek... Um, like family grouping of words for basically beginning and starting and then whenever you consider like generation you're going to generate electricity or something like that it's going to come into being and then your you know re implies to do this again then what you are doing is you are bringing this into being again yeah. and so to y'all's point uh, being born again being born from above new creation new life regeneration is actually the perfect word for this yeah amanda final thoughts final thought and just so like we can kind of also conclude on on some good news and and i think we've already said this but so we can say it succinctly is this is that if sin has real world or sin does have real real world impact then regeneration has a real world impact and oh, so absolutely there is hope uh, that all can be made new. Brother James, give us some closing thoughts today. I'm, I'm so blessed and, and hopeful that in the scripture we hear Jesus say, you must be born again. And Paul expand, there's a new creation. What we call the doctrine of regeneration. Um, I remember the hopelessness of being a sinner and knowing that I in myself was not capable to do the good I wanted to do to become better than what I was there was a, a power a sin that held me back and kept me from being all I could be both for Christ and for myself I was broken and couldn't fix myself. I've, I am amazed by a God that loves me so much that after my whole race has spit in his eye and gone another way and I've done the same for myself that he will reach down with his powerful hand of creation and recreate in me a spirit and a heart that not only wants to do his good work but is capable of doing his good work through his spirit that dwells and empowers me. And Jesus, when he comes to Nicodemus and says, be born again or above, he's not a tyrant. No. He said he's a liberator. And that's exactly what Brother James is telling us. But with that, thank you so much for joining us. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, please send them to us. And if you have any pitchforks, um, you can send them via patreon.com slash kingdom of the logos. And you can do that in donating monetarily to help fund things around here. But also, if you want to help us out, one of the biggest things you can do, grab a link to our content, uh, share our YouTube channel. We're really trying to boost our YouTube audience. We're having a hard time with that. Facebook seems to be doing all right. Um, but check us out. We're on SoundCloud, iTunes, CastBox, and other podcasting outlets where you can download us for free and carry us with you. Uh, just share the word and share the word of the gospel, but also... Um, help grow our program by sharing it with your friends. But with that, God love you and have a blessed day.